Men work in the fields in the sweltering Louisiana heat, watched over by armed guards and wolf-dog hybrids. This is the biggest maximum security prison in the United States, and one of the most dangerous. The Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola is located an hour's journey north of Baton Rouge. The prison began as an actual plantation at which enslaved black people pick the same crops that the prisoners do under similar conditions today. In modern times, the prison population is 74% black. Field work is the default job for most prisoners at Angola, and switching over to other jobs is difficult. For their labor, prisoners earn as little as two cents per hour. The high end of their income might reach 40 cents. Refusing. So, a majority are black. Now, in the article uh, from the AP, it says about 65%. So, the article came out about a day ago. This video, I think, is about a couple of years old. So, the you know, the ratio probably changed a little bit. But even still, majority black state prison that was a plantation. And this reminds me of how the police operate. The police in this country first started out as slave catchers. Let me ask you this. What has changed? Peace the hell out of me. Because if they're catching people, right, for the purpose of putting them in these prisons to become slaves, what changed? I don't see anything different. And then what happened to these prisons? Are these prisons actually there to help us reform or are they there to make us into slaves? What changed in this country? I did the ancestry DNA tests, uh, what it was about a year and a half, two years ago. Uh, my aunt, send it to me because well i can't afford it but she sent it to me she was like hey here's a dna test so she asked me if i wanted one cool you know because i don't know my daddy so hey so i took the dna test and it kind of connected me to ancestry and my cousin's wife uh shout out to you she also did kind of like the genealogy ancestry of our family. And the farthest back that we could go was my fifth great grandfather who was born in 1792. Now, I'm privileged in the way that I know that I'm able to go back that far. There's some black people who are descendants of, of slaves, descendants of the enslaved, freedmen, if you will, that can't go back that far at all. Fortunately for me, we were able to go back that far, but finding out he was born a slave, but he died knowing how to read and write. Okay. So yes, I am a descendant of slaves. So when people come in and go, well, I don't know if you're a descendant of slaves because, and then they'll may, you know, see how I advocate for people who are not black, especially for people who are brown right or poor whites and they may look at me and look at me with a side eye like anyways the 13th amendment said that what we're told is that slavery was abolished and in fact i think we need to examine that because it's not so simple when people talk about slavery and if how it was abolished or if, if it was abolished. Let me share this with you guys really quick. Let me show you something. Here's the 13th Amendment of the United States. It says, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. So, that middle part, that middle part right there, that accept, that makes 
should think, doesn't it? Makes one person think like, hmm, wait a minute, except, what do you mean? There's a, you mean there's actually an exception to slavery within the United States? I'm just telling you, there's some slaves still here in the United States, and it's slavery that is con still considered legal. Some of y'all family members in this country are slaves. I didn't stutter. Some of your family, some of your friends, some of your loved ones are slaves in this country still to this day. And it is not considered illegal. Furthermore, many of you who may not have family that are still slaves in this country are still benefiting from slavery. And I'm not talking about slavery from back in the day, which yes, for all intents and purposes, many people, especially a lot of white people, especially a lot of rich white people, still benefit from the slavery that was started years ago. But slavery that still exists today, you're still benefiting from it. You probably even benefited from it this very morning. You're probably benefiting from it right now as you eat your double cheeseburger. A what? Yes. Yes. Slavery. It still touches and affects all of our very lives right now. So. I want to share this as well, because there is. A video that I want to share with you guys. Because a lot of people do not realize that this still happens. So, I'm going to share my screen really quick and then we'll get into the article. By the way, just to let you guys know, there are white people that are enslaved now. So this recently came out the other day, and this is taking place in Louisiana. So let's get into it. He's turning Tyson's food. He's turning Here we Tyson go. Foods. A hidden, intricate web links hundreds of popular food brands to work done by U.S. prisoners. A two-year Associated Press investigation found that everything from grains, meat, eggs, and milk had been grown, harvested, or produced by incarcerated people. And their labor finds its way into the supply chains of some of the most recognized brands and largest food companies in the world. Hold up, wait a minute. Did y'all have something like that for breakfast this morning? Did you have some Cheerios this morning? Hmm? Maybe a bacon, ham, and cheese? With some egg? Did you have a chicken sandwich for lunch? Lunch was about an hour, two hours ago. Did you? Interesting, right? How you literally could be partaking of the results of slavery when you eat your next meal. I'm gonna, look, I'm gonna tell you right now, after reading the story, I immediately want to take a shower. And you're gonna want to too. But this is important because when you know better, you do better. And then we can talk about how we do better towards the end. But you got to know. So let's go. We followed as cattle raised the Louisiana State Penitentiary 
were transported to a meat processor in Texas. From there, the beef ended up in the supply chains of McDonald's, Burger King, and major grocery stores. I feel like I had became a slave, a product of, 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 of the convict system, because everything that I was doing was profiting the prison. The 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution abolished slavery and involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime. We spoke to prisoners who were working on the same plantation soil where slaves toiled more than 150 years ago. Did it actually stop? A lot of times, those of us who are Black, descendants of slaves in this country, we're constantly being told, we abolished slavery. We did the right thing. It's over, right? Yeah, you know, some people tell us, why are you guys so stuck on the past? It's over. Uh, just to let you guys know, it is not over. In fact, it's still continuing down to this day. How you feel about that? Mm. Doesn't feel good, does it? That great old American democracy. Many were making pennies an hour. Some were getting nothing at all. Others were being contracted out to private companies or taking part in work release programs. Prisoners can sometimes be punished for refusing to work, even thrown into solitary confinement. Oh, but wait. I thought, I thought they said, well, it's not like you're forced into it. It's not like they make you do it. All right. Keep telling yourself that. Time you bump it. Mm. And if they are hurt on the job, they often have little recourse. White lady, white woman, yes, 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 they're now slaves too. Remember what I keep saying on this channel? Every single time I say it, some people just, they, it, it just goes right over their head. It's like, huh? I'm like, whatever they do to us, they're going to do it to you. They did it to us as chattel, right? They made us into shadow. Now, the growing amount of white people who are slaves. Are you listening now? Do you hear me now? Right? Because that. Let me keep. Let me keep on going. I'm. I'm annoying myself now. They aren't eligible for workman's compensation. Um, nor are they protected by other uh, worker safety laws because they're not considered, quote unquote, employees. We're going to have to figure out different ways to make our system a better system instead of just exploiting labor and then calling it crime prevention. The agriculture sector is just a fraction of the overall prison labor industry, which includes everything from public works to stamping license plates. They're learning a skill set. Um, they're learning to be responsible for something. They're learning to pay back their debt to society. Oh, oh, watch the I didn't know picking cotton was a skill set. By this very same, by that very same metric, you could say, well, those slaves, they, they learned this for important skill set while they were enslaved. Isn't that what Ron DeSantis said? They learned skills. that doesn't justify slavery. Jeez Louise, I'm telling you. I learned that if I wanted to be better, I have to make my own way, basically. That the opportunities are here. They're not gonna give them to me. That, 
to an extent, he's correct, but to another extent, he's incorrect because that goes according to just the individualistic mindset that basically says that society is not obligated to give anything to you when in reality, that's a whole part of society is us coming and pulling our resources together so that we may be able to survive and thrive. So yes, we give each other things so that we can survive and thrive as a collective. This whole, oh, well, nobody's actually going to give it to you. It's like, well, if by that very notion, then everything that we have should be made purely from us. So if you're a self-made man or woman or person, then stop driving on the tax-funded roads that you drive on. Stop sending your kids to the schools that are paid for through our taxes, right? But you pay those taxes, right? Why? Because it is part of a collective living in society. So by that very extension, we could do other things, right? Housing, healthcare, education. We can expand that. But some people say, we don't wanna expand it because some people are unworthy but why are they unworthy? Just because you exploited people and got your station in life, but the, the they couldn't, doesn't make you better. And a lot of times, the people who have the most usually get the get what they have through exploitation. Anywho, I'm rambling on. Let's continue. the prisons and corporations benefit from inmate labor. Mm -hmm. The goods wind up in the supply chains of giants like Walmart, Target, Whole Foods, and Costco, just to name a few. The AP also found American prison labor linked to the supply chains of multinational companies such as Cargill that export goods all over the world. This is happening even though Washington has banned imports and seized goods that were produced by prison or forced labor abroad. And DHS is deeply concerned by credible and growing reports of China's state-sponsored use of forced labor and other human rights violations in the Xinjiang region. Several companies told the AP they have policies in place restricting suppliers from using incarcerated workers. Cargill acknowledged buying goods from American prison farms and said it would determine next steps. Others said they would look into the AP's findings, which revealed just how much prison labor touches many of the foods we eat. I told you, you weren't gonna feel very good about this. I don't feel very good about this. Just going to the grocery store to buy food, you're, you may be partaking something that a slave helped create. It's sickening. Knowing what my ancestors went through and the fact that there are still others going through that today, Mm, mm -mm. Let me share my screen really quick. Let's get into this article. This article is more nuanced and detailed. So this is talking about prison labor. So. Let's go down. So it says the, the goods these prisoners produce wind up in the supply chains of a dizzying array of products found in most American kitchens from frosted flake cereal and ballpark hot dogs to gold metal flour, Coca-Cola and rice lamb rice. They're on the shelves of virtually every supermarket in the country, including Kroger, Target, Aldi and Whole Foods and some goods are exported 
including to countries that have products blocked from entering the U.S. for using forced prison labor. So I just want to share part of this piece, hang on, yeah, right here. First off, we want to go to following the money. It says the business of prison labor is so vast and convoluted that tracing the money can be challenging. Some agricultural programs regularly go into the red, raising the question in state audits and prompting investigations into potential corruption, mismanagement, or general inefficiency. Nearly the Nearly half of the agricultural goods produced in Texas between 2014 and 2018 lost money. For example, in a similar report in Louisiana, uncovered losses around $3.8 million between fiscal years of 2016 and 2018. A separate federal investigation into, gra into graft at the for-profit arm of Louisiana's correctional department led to the jailing of two employees. It says, <clears throat> excuse me, correctional facilities, stay steep farming expenditures and unpredictable variables like whether it can eat into profits and while some goods may do poorly, they know others do well. Prisons at times have generated revenue by tapping into niche markets or into their state's signature foods. During the six year period, the AP examined surplus raw milk from Wisconsin's prison dairy went to Belgiocio uh, cheese which makes polyo string cheese and other products that land in grocery stores nationwide like Whole Foods. A California prison provided almonds to Minitern Nut Company, a major producer and exporter. And until 2022, Colorado was raising water buffalo from milk that was sold to giant mozzarella cheese maker, Leprino Foods, which supplies major pizza companies like Domino's, Pizza Hut, and Papa John's. I did not know that our that <laughs> the mozzarella cheese that goes on pizzas and these major chains are made from milk from water buffalo. Did y'all know that? You guys are when you eat cheese from these places, you're eating water buffalo mozzarella water buffalo mozzarella it's not cow it's not cow's milk dear god uh let me continue Let's go. That's a minor point, but I just, I stopped at that. I was like, what? But for, for many states, it's the work release programs that become the biggest cash generators, largely because the low overhead. In Alabama, for instance, the state brought in more than $32 million in the past five fiscal years after garnishing 40% of prisoners' wages. It says in some states, work release programs are run on the local level with sheriffs frequently responsible for handling the books and awarding contracts, even though the programs are widely praised by the state employers and often prisoners themselves report of abuse exists. In Louisiana, where more than 1,200 companies hire prisoners through work release, sheriffs get anywhere from about $10 to $20 a day for each state prisoner they house in local jails to help ease overcrowding. And they can deduct more than half of the wages earned by those contracted out to companies, a huge revenue stream for small counties. <clears throat> so just to let you guys know, this is also one of the reasons why a lot of sheriff's departments are very quick to arrest and jail people, even for what we like to call bro broken windows policing. The reason being is because they're actually making more revenue for their offices, for their state, or for their county, so that they can actually make more money. So they're using prison labor, AKA 
slavery in order to have more for the state. Also, just as an aside, when people talk about, oh yeah, we're gonna lower taxes, right? While that's good, in theory, lowering taxes means that that money has to come from someplace else. Now, one of two things happens when they talk about lowering taxes. It's typically for the top 1%, right? For the richest people within a county or an area or a state, right? So what they do is that they, they will lower the taxes, but who has to eat that tax, right? Who has to eat that? Well, it would be us, the consumers. Those are who are part of the 99%. But when they lower the taxes, it's usually for, for the rich people. But then who also has to eat that? Well, the slaves who are working in our prison systems and in our jails within our local area. Because now, instead of making the money that they would be making, instead, now they're pulling that from them. And now the sheriff's office are making more money. Instead of actually taxing the people who should be taxed. And by the way, just that anybody knows, when they say tax the rich, to me, that is a lazy ass cop out because really we should be, we should be seizing, you know, the, the means of production from these people anyway. And, you know, because a lot of that money is stolen from surplus labor. But anyways, that's one of the points, right? I think that needs to be solidified is like whenever they say, oh, we're, we got to lower taxes. They're fine with lowering taxes, but the thing is, who's going to eat? Who's going to eat that? I think that's. I think that's what's important. Let's continue. Jack Strain, a former longtime sheriff in the state of Tam, uh, Tammany Parish, pleaded guilty in 2021 in the scheme involving the privatization of work release programs, in which nearly 1.4 million was taken in and steered to Strain close associates and family members. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison, which came on top of four consecutive life sentences for a broader sex scandal linked to the same program. Okay. says so incarcerated people also have been contracted to companies that partner with prisons. In Idaho, they sorted and packed the state's famous potatoes, which are exported and sold to companies nationwide. In Kansas, they've been employed at Russell Stover Chocolates in Cal Maine Foods, this country's largest egg producer. Though the company has since stopped using them in recent years, they were hired by Arizona by Taylor Farms, which sells salad kits in many major grocery stores nationwide and suppliers, popular fast food chains and restaurants like Chipotle Mexican Grill. So yes, have I used these salad kits before in my life? Absolutely. Did I know that they were being using prison labor? Hell no. Nah. Does that make me sick to my stomach? Absolutely. Next time, even if you eat a salad, you're not. Yeah, yeah. This is this is this is terrible. Okay, let's continue. It says some states would not provide the names of companies taking part in tra transitional prison work programs, citing security concerns. So AP reporters confirmed some prisoners' private employers with official running operations on the ground and also followed inmate transport vehicles as they zigzag through cities and drove down country roads. The van stopped everywhere from giant meat producing plants to a chicken and daiquiri restaurant. So yes, even restaurants are using slave labor. This one, this one caught me. This one got me in a chokehold. It says one pulled into a manicure grounds of a former slave plantation that has been transformed into a popular tourist site and hotel in St. Francisville, Louisiana, where visitors pose for wedding photos under live oak trees draped with Spanish moss. As a reporter watched the West Feliciana Parish van em emblazoned with Sheriff Transitional Work Program pulled up. Two black men hopped out and quickly walked through the to the restaurant's back door. Once said he was there to wash dishes before his boss called him back inside. 
says the Myrtles, as the antebellum home is known, says just 20 miles away from where men toil in the fields of Angola. So there's another piece that I wanted to talk about as well. That I think is also really important because a lot of us, a lot of us sit here and, you know, I, I know a lot of people think, well, how do we fight against this? You know, and we'll get into that, but I think there's also important to realize that you can do the best you can, but it, there's only so much you can do within the capitalist system. But at least you know what's going on. And if you can mitigate this, then you do what you can. But I also understand. It says, in Alabama, where prisoners were leased out by companies. This, I want you guys to hear this quite low. Mm. I want you guys to really listen to this sentence. First part. In Alabama, where prisoners were leased out by companies. You lease a car. You lease a home. You can lease I don't know uh lawn care equipment. You can lease tools. But leasing out prisoners? That's leasing slaves. That's that's exactly what that is. The AP reporters followed an inmate transport van to poultry plants run by Tyson Foods, which owns brands such as Hillshire Farms, Go Meat, Jimmy Dean, people who make the sausage, and Sara Lee, who make the pies along with company that supplies beef, chicken, and fish to McDonald's. So not only is McDonald's helping out the Zionists by feeding the IDF, but they're also using prison labor to feed some of those Zionists the paleo fish. It's like, I'll have your Zionist Big Mac with a side of slavery. Do you want fries with that? Like, the hell? Oh, my God. The system is so disgusting. It says the vans also stopped at Chicken Processor, part of a joint venture with Cargill, which is America's largest private company. It brought a record of $177 billion in revenue in fiscal year 2023 in supplies conglomerates like PepsiCo. You know, PepsiCo also owns Frito-Lay, which are, are your Doritos, your Lay's chips, your Fritos, all that. Yeah, that's, that's Frito-Lay, which is owned by PepsiCo. So now they're also being... Cargill is also supplying them. So it's almost like every single thing you touch has something associated with slavery. Mind you, did you guys know that Victoria's Secret also uses slave labor? And American Airlines. Let me continue just a little bit more. It 
So, uh, let me shrink this a little bit. Ooh. Where is... Okay. So this is prisons with agricultural programs. This data from prison agriculture lab at Colorado State University shows what kinds of agricultural work are being done in prisons. Some prisons are additionally identified as generating revenue from these activities. So in green, it's gener uh, is revenue generating. Look at this. These, in my eyes, these are still plantations. All these dots are modern day plantations. And for the people who may come in here and go, well, if you don't wanna do that, then maybe you shouldn't commit crimes. Some of y'all who are in states where we is still illegal. Did y'all smoke weed recently? You know, it's still illegal, right? So if you go to jail or prison for drug possession, should you be subject to slavery for, you know what I'm saying? Those of you who may go to jail for not paying your child support, should you be subject to slave labor? There's so many different things that you go to jail for, go to prison for. And this just goes to show where when you especially are poor and destitute within this country, the laws are made so that if you are poor, you automatically are focused in more on more to go to these modern day plantations for the benefit of these corporations. Private prisons are also involved in this. But it's not just private prisons. Here it is, you know, and it happens to women in women's prisons as well. It says, I was in a field with a hoe in my hand and maybe like a hundred other women. We were standing in line in a very closely, closely together. And we had to raise our hoes up at the exact same time and count one, two, three, chop. Worked on prison farms. So... That's what happened to people like her, that she recounted being made to carry rocks from one end of the field to the other and back again for hours. And says she endured taunting from guards saying, come on, pose, it's ho squad. She said later, she said she was later sent back to the fields at another prison after women there complained of sexual harassment by staff inside the facility. She said, we were like, is this punishment? We're telling y'all that we're being sexually harassed and you come back and the first thing you want to do is put us all on host squad. Let me ask you something. I'm also part Welsh and Norwegian. Where the hell did you think that come from? Where did that come from?
what's different? Boy, oh boy. I'm going to share this with you guys too. It says current and former prisoners in both Louisiana and Alabama have filed class action lawsuits in the past four months saying they have been forced to provide cheap or free labor in those states and outside companies practically described as slavery. Prisoners have been made to work since before emancipation when slaves were at times in prison and then leased out by local authorities. It says, but after the Civil War, the 13th Amendment exception clause that allows for prison labor provided legal cover to round up thousands of mostly young black men. Many were jailed for petty offenses like loitering and vagrancy. They were then leased out by states to plantations like Angola and some of the country's biggest companies, including coal mines and railroads. They are routinely whipped for not meeting quotas while doing brutal and often deadly work. Vagrancy is an interesting word because it basically means that if you're standing around not doing anything, then that was considered a crime for people who look like me. You couldn't stand around. This is why the whole loitering and vagrancy laws. Yeah, that's where that comes from. It's important that we remember these things, man. Okay, let me. So we're going to get into this prison, but. I wanted to go to this other piece because a lot of times people will go, well, why don't they just say, no, we're not going to work like this. We're not going to be subject to this. But I think it's important to see what they're subject to as well. Now. Here are some of the crimes. It says the AP sent to through thousands of pages of documents and spoke to more than 80 current or formerly incarcerated people, including men and women convicted of crimes that range from murder to shoplifting to writing bag checks, theft, or other illegal acts linked to drug use. Some were given long sentences for nonviolent offenses because they had previous convictions, while others were released after proving their innocence. Another reason why they do not want to end the drug war is because that chokes the slave labor. Because then if they can't get you on drugs, then that means that diminishes the amount of people that they can arrest, that they can put into prisons and jails, which diminishes the amount of slave labor they have. So it's all tied together. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind. This is why a lot of us, when we say in the drug war, we're also talking about ending, cutting off or choking off the slave labor. It says reporters found people who were hurt or maimed on the job and also interviewed women who were sexually harassed or abused, sometimes by their civilian supervisors or correctional officers overseeing them. 
While it was often nearly impossible for those involved in a workplace accidents to sue, the AP examined dozens of cases that managed to make their way into the court system. Reporters also spoke to family members of prisoners who were killed. So it talks about this man, uh, Dwayne Ellis, Ellison, who was killed in a very horrific, horrific way. Uh, so that was really, uh, it's it just heartbreaking, all because he was being subjected to slavery. So let me see. Ah, uh, here we go. Says Willie Ingram picked everything from cotton to okra during his 51 years in the state penitentiary, better known as Angola. During his time in the fields, he was overseen by armed guards on horseback and recalled seeing men working with little or no water passing out in the triple digit heat. Y'all gotta remember, it gets hot down here. So some days he said workers would throw their tools in the air to protest despite knowing the potential consequences. They come maybe four in a truck, shields over their face, billy clubs, and they beat you right there in the field. They beat you, handcuff you, and beat you again, said Ingram, who received a life sentence after pleading guilty to a crime he said he didn't commit. He was then told he would serve 10 and a half years and avoid possible death penalty, but it wasn't until 2021 that the sympathetic judge finally released him. He was 73. So they are literally beating people if you don't work. What does that sound like to you? Being beaten, sexually assaulted, being subject to inhumane conditions. Hell, there's a part in this article where they said even the horses would pass out from heat exhaustion. The horses that the police are riding on, that the correctional officers are riding on. This is what's happening in this country. So a lot of what's going on, they focus on Angola prison which they talk about is the Alcatraz of the South. I would like for you guys to see Angola and what it is. Let me try to get this here. Yeah. Angola is notorious, by the way. So if anybody doesn't know, we're going to find out right now. And Angola is basically Louisiana State Prison. And I actually talked about some uh, a story associated with Angola a while back. I can't remember how long ago it was, but it had to do with juveniles and how they were subject to inhumane conditions. But we're going to talk about it here. So this is the Angola prison where all, a lot of this is also going on. Men work in the fields in the sweltering Louisiana heat, watched over by armed guards and wolf dog hybrids. This is the biggest maximum security prison in the United States and one of the most dangerous. The Louisiana State Penitentiary at Angola is located an hour's journey north of Baton Rouge. The prison began as an actual plantation at which enslaved black people pick the same crops that the prisoners do under similar conditions today. In modern times, the prison population is 74% black. Field work is the default job for most prisoners at Angola, and switching over to other jobs is difficult. For their labor, prisoners earn as little as two cents per hour. The high end of their income might reach 40 cents. Refusing. So, a majority are black. 
Now, in the article uh, from the AP, it says about 65%. So the article came out about a day ago. This video, I think, is about a couple of years old. So the, you know, the ratio will probably changed a little bit. But even still, majority black state prison that was a plantation. And this reminds me of how the police operate. The police in this country first started out as slave catchers. Let me ask you this. What has changed? Beats the hell out of me. Because if they're catching people, right, for the purpose of putting them in these prisons to become slaves, what changed? I don't see anything different. And then what happened to these prisons? Are these prisons actually there to help us reform or are they there to make us into slaves? What changed in this country? This is why we say we need to change the system because the system is still the same as it always has been. to work or not working fast enough can earn inmates time in solitary confinement not working fast enough can earn inmates time in solitary confinement by the way just to let you guys know according to international law solitary confinement is considered torture so they're subject to torture if they don't work fast enough or if they don't do the work that's slavery And prisoners have been known to pass out from dehydration. So this this particular job is not one of the more uh, desired ones. No, this is like this is the bottom of the barrel. The feel. On top of that, some businesses avoided shutdowns during the COVID nineteen pandemic by using convicts from Angola and other penitentiaries. If that. So during the pandemic, it's basically well. This, this disease is very dangerous to people, so we can't really have people working there. But put the prisoners in there. Their lives mean less. So let's subject them to the pandemic so that we can keep our goods throwing, flowing through, so that we can continue to keep making money. Because their lives matter less. Those of you who have had loved ones in jail or in prison, I've had a few. Do their lives matter less in reality? If something happens to them, how would you feel? Would you feel just a little less bad? I thought all lives were precious. Oh, that wasn't enough to mark Angola down as a grueling place to serve time. There's also a lack of medical care, high rates of suicide, drug overdoses, and abysmal living and working conditions. Conditions are so severe, in fact, that a prison union staged a peaceful work stoppage in 2018 to demand changes. It was put down within the day. Besides its large size and its brutal working policies, Angola prison has a reputation for danger. The facility houses violent criminals in a setting with a reputation for inmate-on-inmate -inmate brutality. They are watched over by underpaid guards and vicious wolf-dog hybrids. According to the Daily Beast, Angola has been called the bloodiest prison in America. And in But when you subject people to inhumane conditions, that could cause violent behavior. That, that, that's, that's just common sense when you subject somebody to inhumane conditions it pro it, it makes them more prone to behavior that makes them want to lash out more case in point gaza instead though they're lashing out at the people who are causing the inhumane behavior in the first place 
aka Israel. But I thought this was the goal was to rehabilitate. But you can't rehabilitate somebody if you're constantly subjecting them to inhumane conditions. In many cases, it's those guards to blame for the violence. In July 2020, a federal court sentenced three former Angola correction officers to prison and a fourth to probation for beating a shackled inmate and then trying to cover it up. The prisoner suffered a dislocated shoulder, broken ribs, and a collapsed lung. For many of Angola's inmates, these conditions are all they'll know for the rest of their lives. Of the more than 6,000 inmates at the sprawling prison, 65% of them are serving life sentences. Even after death, many of these prisoners won't leave Angola's grounds. Their bodies will be interred in the prison cemetery. I Even in death, they're not free. Ironically, the so-called B-Line, a small town home to some 1,600 prison employees, exists right in the middle of Angola's grounds, and the prison is famously accessible to outsiders. Movies have used it as a location, and the Angola Museum on site is a highly rated tourist attraction. Notably, Louisiana has the highest per capita incarceration rate, and a report by the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics found that from 2001 to 2019, the most deaths per 100,000 inmates in the U.S. occurred in Louisiana state prisons. Some of that may be attributable to Angola State Prison's subpar medical care. In 2021, Federal District Court Judge Shelley K. Dick slammed the institution for not providing adequate medical care to the point of violating the U.S. Constitution's Eighth Amendment by inflicting cruel and unusual punishment on the inmates. In her decision, the judge found overwhelming deficiencies in the medical leadership and administration of health care at the prison. Angola was also found to have violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. Many members of the medical staff of the penitentiary have issues of their own, with some of the full-time doctors having had their medical licenses suspended at one time or another, according to a 2020 ProPublica investigative report. And things have only worsened in recent years. If you guys have not... Um... Let me share something with you. This is a side of Shakur's autobiography. I read this on this channel. If you guys want to hear me read and discuss it on this channel, you guys can go to my playlist. But in this book, you get to hear about how Asada Shakur was subject to inhumane conditions while she was serving time in prison. This was back in the 60s and 70s. When it comes to the rights, human rights of prisoners, this country does not care. Rather, the corporations do not care because you're there to work for them and your human needs do not matter. And every single time we think about people in prison, I want you to think about the people who may have medical issues such as drug addiction, who may have gotten themselves into prison. Yes, drug addiction is a medical issue. It is not a criminal issue. It may drive people to do things that they normally would not in their more logical mind because of the addiction. But we also gotta know, and we also gotta remember what causes addiction. Trauma, lack of resources, material needs not being met. These are some of the drivers. And what do they do? They do that and they keep that situation continuing 
so that people will become addicted to drugs so that then the police or the sheriffs can arrest them so that they can put them in this condition so that they can have them work as slaves. It's a vicious and dirty, filthy cycle. In July 2022, the state decided to temporarily house a number of juvenile prisoners in Angola until a new facility was ready. A year later, advocates and the ACLU alleged that those young prisoners were being exposed to dangerous conditions. A federal court filing stated that young inmates were housed in a former death row building, given unsanitary food and water, and exposed to dangerous levels of heat. At least one prisoner also claimed to have been exposed to chemicals used to subdue another inmate. An earlier lawsuit challenging the transfer of young prisoners to Angola was rejected by a judge who declared the inmates a danger to themselves and others. The Just to let you guys know, I actually talked about this, about how juveniles, kids, are being held in Angola, were being held in Angola. And if anybody's been down here in the South knows that it is sweltering in the summer and they do not have proper ventilation or air conditioning in these prisons. And they were holding kids in here. Juveniles are children in prison. I talked about that. Let's continue. The July 2023 challenge resulted in an order to transfer juvenile inmates from Angola by September 15th. The state of Louisiana complied, but it continued an appeal against the order as well. So that's Angola. And so when it comes to the conditions that people are subject to within our criminal justice system, I don't see any justice in it really, we still have slavery. And until we actually truly abolish slavery, it's just a criminal system. It's not a criminal justice system because there's no justice in it. Imagine the people who are in prison for doing the right thing. Maybe they did something that was for the people, like many other Panthers, right? But then they get subject to this. What if some of us are feeding, clothing, housing, you know what I mean? Doing things that actually help our community. But then because it there's a city ordinance or it's against the law in some way, shape or form, we get subject to going to jail or prison and then we're subject to slavery for doing the right thing. This is why it is important for us to do what we can by changing the system. And what does that entail? This entails, are there organizations within your vicinity where you can join to advocate for either people who are incarcerated, you can advocate for helping people who are housing insecure or making sure that people have enough food or even teaching kids different things that could help them so that they won't end up in the school to prison pipeline. There's many different avenues you can go in order to help out people who are, so that either they don't get into the prison industrial complex or if they are, then you can help them try to get out. I know there's 
there's groups like the Innocence Project. But even if somebody did something wrong and they are actually guilty of it, they should not be subject to these inhumane conditions at all. And yet they are. I'm going to share. Hmm. Let me see. Hmm. Uh, there was a site that I was going to go to, but for some reason it's not working right now. Not sure what happened, but I'm going to share this site. soon as it loads. Sorry, guys. Not sure what's going on here. There was a site called 10 for Justice that I point to that talks about, here we go that talks about abolition. And when we talk about abolition, and a lot of times people will be like, well, we can't abolish the police. It's like, when we mean abolish the police, we mean abolish the way it is now and how it operates and rebuild it anew. I think that's really important. Uh, this is 10 out of 10 demands for justice. First one, it says defund the police and reallocate resources to impact the communities, right? Uh, demilitarize the police, eliminate discriminatory policing, prosecution, and sentencing, institute complete law enforcement transparency and, and accountability, independently investigate all police crimes and abuses of power, install community representation, oversight and safety measures, in strategic counter-protest violence, apologize and provide reparations, end the wars, and end carceral punishment. So I want to show this to you guys. Number 10. It says, let me enlarge this just so that eh, we can, okay. It says everyone in jails, prisons and facilities and detention centers beginning immediately with the elderly, disabled and immunocompromised, nonviolent offenders, undocumented immigrants, criminalized survivors and those held on bail or for parole violations Free all political prisoners, including Leonard Peltier and Mumia Abu-Jamal. Remove, accept as punishment for crime from the 13th Amendment, ban solitary confinement, decriminalize misdemeanor offenses, and probation parole violations. Repeal all three strikes and habitual offender laws. Ban the box. End the school to prison pipeline. Repeal truancy laws. Removing police surveillance technology and metal detectors from the schools and eliminating zero tolerance disciplinary policies, suspensions, and expulsions. Close all local jails. Eliminate the prison industrial complex. Close all privately owned prisons. Terminating all contracts with private companies that profit off prisons and banning all police foundations and all new prison construction and in pretrial detention cut funding to prosecutor's offices, abolish ICE in immigration detention, mandate legal immigration status priority to ICE detainees and their families, eliminate civil con commitment, eliminate all carceral alternatives to incarceration and implement measures for intervention, prevention and education, abolish the death penalty, implement a reparative transformative justice model in place of our current system. Now, one of the things I wanted to bring attention to, because a lot of people don't also don't think about this, because I think it's important.
when it comes to the issue of undocumented immigrants, I think we need to take a look at that as well. It says undocumented immigrants. What is one of the reasons why they allow undocumented immigrants to flee to this country? One is because the undocumented immigrants that come to this country are used as cheap labor within our nation. They, they, the ones who are coming here are also victims of the United States and they're being pushed because of destabilization within their country to come here. But some of them are held in detention facilities and those detention facilities also use slave labor. So when they come here, then they're subject to slavery as well. So if they're not subject to slave labor within our detention centers here, especially along the border, then they can get hired by these companies, but then they're also given starvation wages and they can't protest, they can't unionize because the moment they put up a resistance against their employer, against the corporation, guess what? They get deported back to the hellhole that the United States government and the West created. That the United States and the West destabilized. So it always goes back to the corporations. It always goes back to the West and what they do to these countries. And guess what? They also are using these countries in order to perpetuate and facilitate and push the illicit drugs that come into the country. And then they push the drug war which also drives people from our communities into the arms and the hands of the cops, the police, the sheriffs, which then they put us through the system, put us back into the prisons, and then subject us further into slavery. Then who makes out like bandits? Cargill, McDonald's, Tyson Chicken, Victoria's Secret, American Airlines, and all these other corporations, because now they don't have to pay, either they pay very little or nothing at all for the labor that they're actually getting. This is why worker solidarity is also very important because worker solidarity would tell us, no, we do not want people to be working for free or nearly free. They need to be paid a living wage for whatever they do, even if they are incarcerated, fine. Even if you even if you still believe in incarceration, they still get should pay paid a living wage, and it should be voluntary. Cry with your mom. Cry to your mama about it. Because if we're truly devoted to actually rehabilitating people, you do not rehabilitate people by means of torture and inhumane conditions. That's not how it works. If I, something happens to my leg and I go to rehab, are you gonna break my leg even further as a means to rehabilitate it? Does that work? And so when it comes to how we treat carceral punishment, we need to end it. And so this is why it is important that we not only look at these demands, but we also join organizations that also push for these demands as well. And, and, and then we also join groups that are pushing for a better, more just system for all of us. So if in case, so that we won't end up in that system in the first place. So there's the site. 
I'll leave that to you. Look up some different groups within locally that are also doing what they can for the community because that is what's going to help change our system, especially the ones that are local. Okay. Thank you so very much for watching my channel and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jvfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.